pollinator workshop on such a drizzly day. Nice to see you all. I'm Patty. I work at Beak and one of the co-sponsors of this event. And I'm very happy to introduce Tom Sullivan. Of, he's a landscape designer with Pollinators Welcome and has specialized in pollinators and their gardens for how many years, Tom? Ten. Ten years. So enjoy and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Well, uh, my business name is Pollinators Welcome, and uh, I try to focus on bees, native bees in particular. Um, <clears throat> but uh, even though the plants that I'm going to show are attract uh, native bees, they also attract honeybees too, for for the most part, and many other insects. So, but I'm going to focus on bees because that's kind of where what I do focus on, and it's a little a little easier to talk about because uh, their needs are a little less complex than butterflies. So, uh, <clears throat> my whole thing is to try to bring, bring people together with the habitat so that we can start uh, creating refuge, refuges, uh, refugia for uh, various insects. It's so important, uh, if you heard recently how much, uh, how much, how, Badly, uh, pollinators, uh, <clears throat> all insects in general, are being affected by uh, lots of different uh, forces, um, from pesticides to global warming and to uh, reduction in habitat. So uh, those are some of the biggest uh, forces that are, and they're big. <laughs> There's not a, neither of those three are, have any uh, are, are something we can actually get our head around. But we can start doing something locally uh, in our own gardens, in our own land. And we can also do things politically with various groups that are working to uh, force the government to pay attention. <laughs> and right now it's getting exceedingly hard to get the government's attention. <clears throat> so today you, know, you have this in your handout there um, of all of these plants. This is a recent list that I compiled from uh, Suzanne Hale, who, who was a PhD uh, student at um, a postgrad at U University of Massachusetts, Small Farm Institute. And she had this humongous list that, I, uh, that she lent to me and I collapsed it down to full sunny, uh, full sun, uh, shade, uh, <laughs> full sun, sandy soil or dry soil uh, species that are particularly attractive to, to bees. So we're going to be working off of that and I'm going to show you uh, just a little bit about where you are in case you don't know. Uh, and the native pollinators and their nesting and forage needs. Uh, the procession of plants, uh, just a summary of progression of plants through the season. And then uh, all these other plants. And there's about 60 of them. <laughs> so, if you, if you uh, need a break, you just say, hey, I need a break, and we can stop, because there's a lot of them, and I might need a break, too. Cause, but it, they're, they're beautiful, very functional plants. Yes? Are all of these perennials? Yes. Yes, I believe so. There might be some that are uh, annuals, like the herd uh, rubecchias, and I don't know that there are any others that are... On that list. So the Rebecca is just self seed that? There's my own. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, well, they do come back perennial as long as they're not being crowded out. As soon as they get crowded out, they, they don't compete. And then, but they put out a zillion seeds. So whenever mm -hmm. there's a disturbance, they will fill that disturbed niche because they have seeds everywhere. Okay. And then uh, this is also a design class. So we're going to hopefully put plants in the ground today. Maybe when it gets a little nicer, um, but we're going to look at these different layers, uh, the structural, the seasonal theme, and functional layers. And there's another layer too, but I decided to cut it out because like the herdas, uh, Rebecca herdas and other plants that seed very heavily, uh, the Coryops, uh, they, uh, that's another thing altogether. So I thought it would be simplifier, sim more simplified to keep those out for now. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is a Google Earth shot 
um, this morning, but uh, we are <clears throat> right here. Is that right? Harry Ellen? Pardon? <clears throat> Worship. Yes. Are we, are we oh, yeah, are we here? Is that our house? Is that your house? Uh, I don't see the fields. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Well, this was the, this was the oh. address. <laughs> anyway, you're on Camp Arden Road. Well, we're not we can't couldn't get very close because a lot of trees on that anyway. So let's just look at the broader scope. Here we are along the the river, and uh, and there's a fair amount of forested land in Vermont still, right? So, <clears throat> but we do have some open land along the river, uh, the ski slope, these open uh, fields here and along roadsides. So the reason that's kind of important because <clears throat> the more species you have, or the more diversity in the landscape you have, the more potential there is for uh, a higher diversity of species. <clears throat> so there's a rather low diversity of species when it's forest. But when it's a recently forested, uh, recently cut land, uh, there's a lot of gaps, there's a lot more life uh, a lot more flowering plants, various cherries, and all these seasonal uh, <clears throat> plants to grow on the forest floor. So there's a lot more potential for food. And so uh, that's why I'm just showing, uh, showing that, and then just showing the patchwork of how much open land there is compared to forested land. So you're in a fairly heavily forested area. And anytime you have an opening, you have gardens, you have diversity of flowers, most people are planting, a lot of people are planting flowering plants. So there's a high diversity of uh, species, and which is really good. So we actually have a big impact on the environment. We have a, the more we garden, the more people start growing plants that aren't full of pesticides, the, the happier they are going to be, and more likely we're going to be able to feed ourselves. <clears throat> so. The native bees, native pollinators. So there's a great diversity. Um, can you all see in the back there? Okay. Um, flies are pretty decent pollinators, although they're not known for it. They're kind of uh, helter skelter the way they fought, fly around. They're mostly getting food. They're not doing much else. Uh, and they're getting, they're pollinating because they have uh, hairs on their body. And they get fairly close on top because they're mostly trying to get uh, to the nectar, but they're also eating pollen as well. Uh, <clears throat> butterflies have a great reputation for being pollinators, but aren't great, great pollinators. Are specific plants they, they pollinate, but for the most part, they're, they uh, are not great pollinators because they have scaly bodies. Their wings are, are scaly, and they have some hairs underneath on their abdomen, but for the most part, they're not the greatest, but they're the most often associated with pollination. Um, but there, there's, it's hard to beat them. And when we're trying to design for, for butterflies, which sometimes I think I should switch my whole thing, like I should be about butterflies, because butterflies are, uh, the spiritually, they help, they affect us in a re really big way because of their free spirit, but also because of their ecology that keeps them alive is much more complex. And so, my whole thing is that if we start paying more attention to who's coming to the flowers, we uh, to the um, non-pesticide flowers that we plant, then we'll start creating more more of that and we'll create, start protecting more lands and more gardens as refuge for all these insects. Anyway, diverge a little bit there. <laughs> Beetles are the uh, original pollinators uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. They, when flowering plants started coming out, they started producing uh, <coughs> uh, protein-rich pollen to attract something, and the beetle said yes, and they started eating it, and eventually the bees started getting off that this is pretty good food. 
where before the bees, the pollinating bees that we know today, were at one point, uh, many, many millions of years ago, were wasps. They were predators, just like many of the wasps we see today. They have stingers. They would use their stingers to uh, stun the insects that they were feeding their young. So as a predator, they were, they were very uh, bad stingers. But when they decided to go to pollen, it was because of the protein that they could feed to their, to their eggs, which I'll show you later. Um, there was a great emergence, uh, emerge, emergence and div divergence of, of flowering plants, and there was a great then divergence of, uh, of, of pollinating species. And then the bees, because of the way that they're constructed, they were much better. And I'll tell you more about that, too. <clears throat> but anyway. So you're saying that the wasps were really, or beetles and wasps, were really important in the diver diversity that grew. Yes, uh, well, not so much the beetles, when the bees, when, when, when the wasps, who, who weren't effective pollinators, turned into bees, <laughs> who I became... See, so, but it sort of went in that progression. That, yeah, because the bees were able to transfer the pollen, right. made the, I mean, this is millions of years of development, right? Ooh, yeah. So uh, those seeds then could be taken by a bird or a lizard or a, you know, right. dinosaur to someplace else. And then, uh, and that that meant that their their species could could expand into all, all over Pangaea or wherever the. Yeah, I was just sort of interested in that progression. Yes. You know, yes. Like, well, it had to be pollinators yeah. to be able to move the pollen around, right. and then eventually it grew because the plants started getting into the act. More plants. I don't know how that happened, but um, that would be a really nice thing to know. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, the, also we have uh, hummingbird moths, which are pretty good pollinators, and they're very beautiful too. They look like hummingbirds, and they look a little bit like moths, and they their wings flap as uh, almost as quickly as hummingbirds, I believe. And hummingbirds too. I mean, those two species have little hairs on their beak, and those become very effective for pollination because they can. The pollen can get caught on the hairs and then be available to the to the next flower. <clears throat> also, bees. There's a honeybee and a bumblebee and a blue orchard bee, also called a mason bee. Very effective pollinators amongst all the species. They're pretty good ones that we can raise, and, and uh, so that makes them very important. And wasps, they'll visit flowers, but they, they don't, they're not really great pollinators because they're going there mostly for nectar, which all bees and all insects, when they're getting nectar, they're getting energy, just like they get a cookie and, uh, and some coffee. Uh, but they'll go to get this uh, energy to be able to fuel their flying so they can stay strong and fly all day. And there's also moths, lots of moths get into the act of pollination but we very rarely see them because they're mostly active at night. So. So moths have uh, hairs on them that can affect the pollen? Yes, yeah, so they have hairs on their, lots of hairs on their body. Uh, I'm not so keen on all the plants that they visit, but there are plenty of them. And they're, so they must be getting, they're, uh, they're at least getting nectar. If not, uh, I'm not sure that they use pollen, but they can transfer pollen. So you can be a transporter of pollen without having any use for the pollen at all. So there's a great diversity of pollen bees as well. So this is real special. I will go back to bees and talk about all the ones uh, that we can categorize fairly easily. Um, there's a sweat bee who uses sweat, comes to us, uh, to get minerals that are exuded when we sweat, and they help, that helps them and those, uh, all the sweat bees in their family with their reproductive needs, so they can uh, 
they really benefit by that. I don't know where they get the salt otherwise. Um, carpenter bees, uh, which drill perfectly round holes in anything we construct. <laughs> but that's where they get their, their name as a carpenter bee, because they drill a round hole. Um, and they're very, very good pollinators. Poly polyester bees are bees that uh, line their tunnels in the ground with um, a polyester-like substance that they bring up out of their stomach somewhere, and they they are able they have this special adaptation on their mouth part to be able to it's like sort of like a plastering paddle where they can line the tunnel and that keeps moisture water from entering and allows vapor to escape. So sound like anything that we Very know? Advanced. <laughs> Tyvek or and uh, Gore-Tex. Uh, the so bumblebees. They, bumblebees get their. So the the polyester bee then is a ground dweller. Yes. And that's where they nest. Yes, most of them are ground dwellers. Oh, okay. Um, and bumblebees get their name from uh, from the sound that they make. <laughs> the squash bees are kind of specialists on squash plants, but we don't have many of them in the northeast. They're mostly uh, down south or in southwest. Anyway, they're a special family of bees that visit all the cucurbits. Uh, not that everybody else doesn't, but they specialize in them. They'll even sleep in the flowers. <clears throat> Uh, mason bees, they, uh, they get their name. They're also called blue, blue orchard bees. They get their name because uh, they use mud in the construction of their nest, and they live above the ground in woody structures. Mining bees, because they're excellent miners, they can dig you know, far deeper and, and, uh, and are just really good at uh, getting soil out of the ground. So, and there are many species of them. Does that help aerate the soil and, and build soil? Probably. Water holding capacity? Water holding capacity? Yeah, or air. Infiltration, if they're dip boring holes, I'm just wondering if that's like part of the ecosystem below the ground that would be helpful for spongeability. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But they try to stay where it's higher and drier. Oh, I see. Well, so, so they, uh, get the, they get the soil and bring it out. Yeah, they're trying to remove soil, but uh, but yes, uh, but when they're in there, they're trying to get their the way they build their nest. I'll show you. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get rid of the water. They're yeah. trying to to they may there may be a secondary benefit, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. especially after they've left their nest. I just came from four days of soil carbon sponge seminars. Oh. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just about the opposite of what they what a plant wants for what they need. Okay. There's a little bit the ones in the ground. And also there's a Serotina bee, which is a small carpenter bee. And they don't have a common name yet. I'm, I'm calling them the pithy stem bee because they can drill holes in pithy stems and lay their eggs in and, and plants like staghorn sumac, uh, the brambles, raspberry stem, black, blackberry stems, and elderberry. And then there are other stems that have pithy, other plants have pithy stems. So you can put bundles of those out uh, for them, especially if you're growing umbels. You'll see them on fennel and uh, caraway and uh, dill and plants like that. Lots of little flowers or tiny little bees. Is it only a little aster flower in the picture? I was wondering. Yeah, there's a little aster Oh, yeah, that looks like a, um, an aster, yes, yes. That's funny. Uh, yes, they they could be out. They have a long a long lifespan. So in the later summer. Yes, the later summer. Yeah. So their relative size. <laughs> so they uh, they they range like wow. this. Uh, carpenter bees bigger than bumblebees, and then they goes around. There's a blue orchard bee. Uh, there's a serotina, so you can see the wide range of sizes, and their size uh, not only uh, has to do with their access to the flowers that they visit, because the big bee is not going to uh, 
I mean, a little tiny bee isn't going to be able to really pollinate a big flower unless it has tiny little flowers. And bumblebees will go to tiny little flowers only if they have to because the amount of nectar that's in the flower is, is less. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, but their size is also, um, also determines how far they can fly. So that, therefore, how far are they, uh, how far is their nest away from the, uh, the flower resource? So you try to just keep that in mind when you're growing plants. You grow them in more in bunches or not too far away from each other, the same species. Therefore, when the bee could be a bumblebee that could fly up to a mile away, isn't you know, expending a whole lot of energy trying to trace flowers all of the same species all over the place. Hey, just keep that in mind. It makes it a little bit more resourceful. But if they're nesting close by, it's hard to know if they are, um, then it's not a big problem to have them dispersed. But if you're growing plants, good to have them you know, relatively close to each other. So po pollen uh, from angiosperms, you know, the, most of what we see is a flowering plant. Grasses are flower, have flowers too, but they're rather nondescript in a lot of ways. Um, but these flowering plants, these angiosperms, have heavy, sticky pollen. It's full of fats, proteins, minerals, <clears throat> and vitamins. And um, it's essential, essential food for uh, pollinator or bee larvae to consume. And it also helps them uh, with their immunity and fight off parasites and pathogens. And they, this, uh, the amount of, um, <clears throat> protein that they, there's a, there's a variation. There's all flowers, all species do not have the same protein uh, content, percentage of protein per plant. So <clears throat> bees are always going to go for, for the highest source of protein that they can get because, or that they can digest. So all bees can't digest all pollen. Uh, <clears throat> most bees can digest or consume uh, most nectar, but the pollen is, is something different. It's more complex. As species diversified, along with, um, uh, <clears throat> along with the species of plants diversified, along with their species that kind of attended to them, the generalists were gonna have uh, greater access. They were gonna be able to digest more of, uh, more ver uh, of higher variety of species of pollen. And then there are also some bees that uh, can only go to a few plants or a few or plants from one family or a few families. So they're going to be much more picky about what they can eat, and, but they're always going to go for what they uh, have traditionally gone to <clears throat> for the most part, unless they can't find those plants. And then they're going to, then they're going to try to uh, survive off of something else. <clears throat> are pussy willows high? Okay. Prissy willows are very high. And you always see them swarm in pussy willows. Yes, they're really important. Swarm, yeah. Very important. It's a real, real for bumblebees and these early andrinas and the, um, the mining bees, especially the early species, and uh, in the cellophane bee. Remember we saw that, this, the cellophane bee? In that earlier picture, polyester bee. Polyester, I'm sorry, polyester. As names used interchangeably. <laughs> so uh, nectar is, is very uh, kind of similar, like I said, but it, they do differ. They differ in their amino uh, acid content, the little bit of proteins that they have, uh, various lipids. These all to kind of distinguish them from one another. Some also have vitamins which is very important for them. Some plants, like the tea plant, and there are others that have caffeine. And uh, these alkalides, alkaloids are the ones that, when they really start distinguishing uh, from species to species, uh, those are the biggest ones that kind of make it so when, they, when a plant is trying to limit to just a few species that they really want to serve, 
and they'll, they'll control their alkaloids, make them either digestible or not. And some of the same material that's in the leaf, when, when insects go to chew on leaves, all leaves are not alike. Plants have, have, uh, had, have had lots of strategies for keeping herbivores from eating them. Mostly it's with alkaloids to try to make them a little bit toxic than, than some species like the butterfly or the uh, monarch butterfly can consume milkweed where a lot of other insects can't and it's toxic to most everything else except the monarch who learned how to do it and, uh, and the plant never learned how to ward the monarch off. Of course the monarch probably helped, helped pollinate them so they were a little bit okay about that I guess. So it's all about food for the bees. That's what they're mostly concerned about. And, <clears throat> and this is a, a little larvae, just kind of broke out of being an egg, nice, clear, and shiny. Trying to figure out, what is this here? Where am I? But this is a ball of pollen with nectar. So the, the bee makes multiple trips. <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of flowers to make enough of a ball to take into their nest and they uh, then they squirt some nectar on top of it make it and then they lay an egg on top of that and it makes perfect balanced protein and carbohydrate for them to consume <clears throat> most bees are solitary as opposed to social the social bees are the bumblebees who live kind of in the ground or near the ground. Uh, they don't over, they overwinter deeper in the ground, but when they make a nest, they're going to be relatively close to the ground or if not just right below the ground. Where our honeybees are up in the air and they're wood nesters. <clears throat> they're cavity nesters too, mostly living in hollow trunks of trees, uh, except for we've learned, our honeybee keepers have learned how to store them in boxes. Basic same thing. But bees were mostly up in and uh, hollow, and up up the way up high in the up in, high in the air, um, away from most of the predators. <clears throat> but the solitary bees are it means to be a solitary bee, you are creating your own nest and you're laying all your own eggs. You don't have any helpers, um, and you uh, pretty much have about 30 eggs, and then you lay them all. And then you die. Pretty brutal, isn't it? But anyway, they can do that without knowing. They've never been taught. And they go down somewhere in this climate, about a foot, foot and a half, in Central America and where it's uh, drier, they can go maybe three feet uh, down. Um, <clears throat> but most of the solitary bees are ground nesters, so the 70% of them. So, and they're very hard to see. You can be in the ground, a little tiny hole, look like an anthole, perhaps bigger though, like the size of a pencil, diameter of a pencil. And you can, if you see a, a hole like that, sometimes it'll have little granules of sand or soil outside. If they're, you can tell the difference if it's an anthill or a bee hill by what? How can you tell them? Mm -hmm. It's coming in and out. <laughs> yeah, right. So you have to have patience to wait for the bee. But it won't be long for, before an ant comes in or out of a hole, right? So <clears throat> that's a good sign. So you're looking for ants. If you don't see ants, then it's probably a bee. And if you have the patience, you have the time, check it out. So the solitary bee life cycle, uh, they're mostly spending their adult life a very short adult life, four to six weeks. Mm. But most of the time they're spending it in either an egg or larval form or a pupa. So this takes, I don't know, 10 half, 11 months where they're only as an adult out foraging for about a very short amount of time. So, <clears throat> so it's, really, uh, it's really important to, to know that. When you're seeing them, you're seeing something for kind of this uh, fairly short lifespan. 
as an adult. And so when they go, like, no, I'll go on. Do they hatch around the same time of year? Is there certain conditions, uh, weather-wise or climate-wise, that will have an abundance of adult bees at the same time? Uh, for different species, you mean? For solitary bees that are only... Yes, bees? so they all emerge at different times. They, okay. Uh, per species. species, and they're trying to kind of time it right by the weather, so our plants, uh, according to when they could emerge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're emer emerging sort of out trying to figure out what, we, uh, what my mother was eating what's before she dinner? died. What's up for dinner, yeah. You know, right. <clears throat> and then she com they come out and they're, they're going around to get uh, whatever, they're scar looking around for plants that they can actually consume. The first thing they do, though, is they look for where they can lay their eggs. Okay. Hmm. And then they look for the plants. And they'll go, they will go to plants to get nectar in the beginning just to be able to uh, support their flying. So but will for males the look for, or is it just the females that are going to look for where to lay eggs? Yes. The males are looking for the where to find the females. Right. Okay. And then when the females uh, are found, they pretty much don't hang around very long. Mm. Uh, they try, but the women are too, I mean, the females are too busy. Yeah. Because they've been usually bred by multiple males. Oh. And so they figure, you know, this is okay. old hat. Okay, I'm, I got used to this. <laughs> and then they, uh, they, they, when they're bred enough, they know that they, uh, mm. they're a signal inside that uh, they don't need any more mating. They better better go find a place for these eggs that are developing. So, I realize that uh, this talk cut out a lot that I usually uh, go into for nesting and things like that because it's really trying to get to the plants. But so I'll, I'll stop here just to answer any questions you might have about nesting. And bees. And well, would you recommend trying a nesting box, or it depends on the garden? It's a lot of fun to do. Doesn't take much. Doesn't take much to make one. But yes, you can. Uh, there are lots of people making them now. I used to make them, but I don't do that anymore. But there are uh, there are various uh, things. So that that should be about six inches. Uh huh. And to get a mason bees. It should be about five sixteenths to uh, to uh, three eighths or so. The bamboo. Diameter. The bamboo. Uh, this is a reed. I think it's. it's I think it's like Phragmites uh, from the West Coast. I bought these from a company in, in the West Coast. Uh, <clears throat> there are also these paper tubes that you can take the liner out of. And once they're filled, and sometime in December or January, you can take them apart because I have little silk covered um, cocoons. And you can actually wash them up and clean them up and dry them and uh, store them that way. Store them in the refrigerator, actually. Um, or store them outside in a safe place where mice and birds and squirrels can't get them. And there's also Bamboo. Oh my god. Oh, this is cool. Somebody yeah. made that happen. Anyway, here, I'll pass this around. Okay, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> somebody's in there. Yeah, somebody's in there. And it's, and it's fresh. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh, that happened. Good. Anyway, uh, bamboo is uh, relatively pretty, uh, it's pretty tough stuff. That, that, you see what at the end you mean? Yeah, you see that thing on the end? That's like a, that's a, a clay plug. So, where so they, they plug it up? Yeah. They, um, a few of them are plugged up. Yeah, there's two of them, right? Where would you suspend these? Um, not too far from flowers. Oh, so You're not far from your garden or... I've seen some really pretty ones. Yes, three, three to six feet off the ground, facing east. Because they wake up earlier in the morning. I, I made the mistake, or not the mistake, I'm in haste. This year, I forgot a, um, uh, a, f 
a two by four that I had uh, drilled holes in a couple years ago. And I left it out last year and they filled it up. I go, oh, I didn't mean that. So I brought it into the porch and I uh, brought a bunch of other things, open porch, and uh, I, f I covered up with a bunch of seeds and flowering plants with the intention I was going to get the seeds and everything, but I never got to. So this, this spring, they, uh, these, these bees started flying all over the place. I didn't know where they came from. My wife said, hey, you got to come home here. They're flying all over the place. They're buzzing everywhere. And we have a young boy living in our house who uh, was really freaked out. And he has red hair. <laughs> and supposedly, I never knew, but red hair will attract bees. They're drive bombing him. Oh, <laughs> so he's freaked out. But I had to come home. So anyway, I had to, I had to do something. So I, I grabbed the box with, and I pushed, put a bunch of tubes in it and put it right there. Okay, I thought that was solved, you know, and then they were using it, and then for some reason, you know, they were still flying all around, so I had to move it. So I moved it and put it on top of the uh, garage. Well, the garage, this one was facing west. Usually, I put them facing east. Well, it took them two days to find this one. The ones on the porch, they were still, sorry, where are you? It was, it was here, I swear. How could, you know, they were flying everywhere looking like, this is crazy. So anyway, they eventually found it. But those bees definitely wake up later. They are definitely slower uh, than, the, than the others. They get later sun because they're facing west, but um, anyway. So, so they, uh, the thing you need to know about uh, those, it's relatively easy to supply tubes for, uh, for the mason bees and leaf cutters. Uh, the mason bees have already really started, so it may be a little bit late to get them. But you could, all, you could go to the leaf cutter bees, and you probably have them around, and they take a smaller diameter. Reed, you can just, oh, I'm sorry. Could you do a mixture of different sizes? Yes, you can. Bees? Yes, you can. Now the leaf cutters, they're gonna, and say that what the bees are doing, they're partitioning, they're making little cells inside these tubes. <clears throat> if it's a mason bee, they're going to line it with cement or mud, mud and sand. And they'll, they'll line it, they'll lay their egg on top of a, uh, a provision, which is nectar and pollen, and then they'll make a little ceiling, which becomes the bed for the next one. And then they, they just keep doing that until they fill up the end. And they put, they put a plug on the end, a thicker plug than they do for their partition because they want to keep wasps and other predators from uh, getting in. So that, that works relatively well. Um, if you keep them together with the leaf cutters, the, leaf cut, the, the mason bees come out early in the spring. They're active almost right as soon as the maples start blooming. The maples are really the big, the big event crocuses and various other things. Willows are really important, but when the maples come, they ignore almost everything else because it is such a big supply, and so they, they'll go to that. And then the mason bees are going to be active until the beginning of June or so. <clears throat> so. Then the leaf cutters come in, overlap with them really closely. They're probably a little bit active towards the end of May or the beginning of June, and they line their nest wooden hollow nest with leaves, pieces of leaves. They go and they cut, in, mostly in the apple family, and they cut almost perfectly round holes in the, in the leaf, and they fly with the leaf, <laughs> and they go in there and they just, they bring it in and they, they, I don't know, they slather it a little bit like wallpaper, and then they make this perfectly round tube and make the partition, build up the next one, 30 eggs. When the 30 eggs have, they laid their 30 eggs, they did their job. You know, Do they, they pollinate apple trees, is that? No, they're a little late for the power. Oh, it's too late for that. Yeah, apples are now, or soon, anyway. Yeah, mine aren't blossoming yet, but okay. Um, but they will t use the apple leaves, the apple tree leaves? Yeah, they'll use uh, anything in the uh, rose family. 
is their, their, their preferred. I guess it's nice and pliable mm -hmm. and big enough. But they make a lot of holes and uh, you just have to, you see round holes and say, oh no, get out the insecticide. Oh. You say, oh my God, we're feeding little leaf cutters. They're beautiful little bees. Okay, so uh, talk a little bit about the procession of uh, the summary of uh, pollinating plants. It's all about forage, right? They're out there. They're trying to get their uh, feed their young. And here I'm showing the the bumblebee and the honeybee, who are often competing for the same flowers they go to a lot of the same same so there uh, whenever there's a honeybee colony around there's pressure on the environment for the, the bumblebees especially and other bees too because because um, honeybees take a tremendous amount of res resources so I have I, well, I would like to say that all honeybee keepers should be flower growers should be meadow makers <laughs> should be plant growers and I would love to see that uh, honey beekeeper associations come together and start uh, supporting the plants that their bees and all the other pollinating bees um, need. And I, th I think the talks that I've given the uh, beekeeping associations, they seem to be really into it. I don't know about how f when it's going to start, but we can, always, uh, we can always talk to them. I think it's a really important thing. So uh, the flowers, I, I stepped away from the progression a little bit. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to show you the different kinds of flowers. <clears throat> that was basically 10 different kinds. You can see that access to the flower does uh, play a part. Where a flower like this, rather easy access, right? It's kind of open, flat, easy to land on. No special uh, apparatus to, to get the nectar and pollen, except if you can't eat it. <clears throat> you can see this uh, tubular flowers. It's a little specialized a little tube. It's got a certain diameter, a certain depth. The tongue of the bee needs to be long enough. You see, that's fairly accessible too, although there are little deeper tubes there. What is that? Black? What is that? Queen Anne's lace? Yes. <clears throat> Very accessible, right? Very open, very shallow. Bumblebees will go to Queen Anne's Lace if they have to. And I've seen them do it. And you see, you know, uh, Singer sewing machines. That's what it reminds me of when they're on these. <laughs> it's very fast. But anyway, bumblebees, though, have very specialized abilities. <clears throat> they have a lot of force in their body. They can pry open these little lids here that little smaller bees can't quite manage. Um, they can get their tongue down into deeper tubes. Um, uh, let's see. And they can buzz pollinate. Did you ever, you ever hear that buzz pollination? They can kind of detach their wings. I don't know how they do that, really. I don't know how to do it. But they can make this vibration that's like the key of C. And it's like a tuning fork. <clears throat> Sets the pollen inside those flowers. Tomatoes, uh, cranberries, blueberries, where most of the honeybees can't do this. So that's one place they're not competing with honeybees. And really important plants to give to them. Uh, and tomato, I said tomato. So what happens is that that vibration sets the pollen loose and it starts flying around. It's good for the plant because the pollen is that type of plant. They can use their own pollen for some reason. Um, <clears throat> but because that pollen is flying around, the bumblebee can get it all over it and start cleaning itself off when they fly into the next flower. They can do it faster, you can see. But their pack takes combing it off their head and their, their thorax and their abdomen and they're packing it on their legs. There's a little bit of pollen right there. And sometimes they get a lot bigger. And bumblebees are very efficient pollinators because they can fly far, they visit many, many species, and they can carry a lot at once. So they're very, very important. 
And there's lots of different kinds of flowers, lots of different species. This comes from North Creek Nurseries catalog a number of years ago. Color matters to some bees because they can, they, uh, they can zero in when they're flying out. They come around, they go, oh, there it is. <laughs> And like you can see, the access is very uh, good to, uh, for some of the plants and some that aren't. So easy to, uh, to visit. You can imagine uh, what kind of an insect or what kind of a pollinator comes to a plant like that, that honeysuckle vine? Honey. Honey. Yes, yes, of course. Even a longer tongue, right? And even a lo longer beak to go inside. Bumblebees can't get inside those. So the progression now starts. <laughs> so we begin with all the bulbs, but also right along with the bulbs or right before the bulbs. Pussy willows and various other willows, really, really important. And, and you'll see when you, when you plant them that uh, how many species are coming to them. <clears throat> and right, <clears throat> right after that will be all the spring ephemerals that are growing in the forest floor if you don't have too much deer pressure. <clears throat> uh, deer will eat most of them. Um, and I was looking for them as I was driving up here in the, in the floor of the forest here. I didn't see too many, so I was figuring you guys might have a lot of deer around here. Is that true? Deer yeah. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so anyway, these are important plants. Violets are also very important. Dandelions are pretty important. Uh, blue, did we say bluets? Mm -hmm. Yes? Bluets. Yes. Bluets, I've, I've seen a lot of those lately. Um, so we have all the spring stuff. And then late spring and all through the summer, we have thousands of plants to choose from. Now, Vermont might have a list that's smaller than Connecticut. So it would probably be good to check out all the plants can grow here. And they're probably, uh, probably uh, the Eco Center, Vermont Eco Center for Eco Studies. They have a good list and there are others too. And I, I have a list to show you a little bit later. And then we get to the end of the year with the goldenrods and asters, and, which are exceedingly important. Um, we, uh, we have a great variety of asters and fairly big variety of um, Golden rods. Gold rods are hard to think about for the most part in garden situations because they can take over. Some species can, but there are some clumping forms, clumping species too, to be aware of. Uh, I don't have a full list of those yet, but the gray aster is one. And I think the zigzag aster. And I, I want to do a, a bigger list on, on those asters because, I mean, I'm sorry. Goldenrod. I mean goldenrod. And we know there's a lot of asters. And I think asters can be played with in lots of beautiful ways, too. Um, <clears throat> there's the New England aster, which can get about six feet high. Uh, I cut mine down June 21st at two feet, and then they end up being about four feet with a lot of flowers. So it's a pretty good technique. Uh, <clears throat> this is a woods blue aster. And then right before, uh, well, after the woods blue aster and the New England aster have gone by or pretty much out, uh, aster blongifolia comes in and goes right in deeper into the, into the end of the season <clears throat> for asters. I, I really, that's a really important plant, aster blongifolia, and there's a, there's a number of different cultivars. Uh, this is what we're seeing with some grasses, native grasses. This is a little, uh, little blue stem. There's some uh, um, Asclepias tuberosa, not tuberosa, but uh, swamp, swamp uh, milkweed. And some willows. Anyway, I, I always try to put in some uh, <clears throat> Some of these guys, I'm forgetting the name of them. <laughs> Zinnias? Zinnias? Zinnias, yes, right. And the bee bomb. And the bee bomb, too. Uh, so is the um, swamp milk food, when is 
what milkweed is in the summer. Just yeah, they they, bloom, they start blooming so like, um, like fairly early June, and they'll bloom for a good six weeks, I think. Do uh, you have that experience? I couldn't tell you when. What yeah. the season is. Okay. Very, very important too for wasps. So if you're trying to protect your apple trees or various other fruits, it's really good to attract the wasps because they will help protect against predator insects who like to eat flowers and plants. And what flower is that? Swamp milkweed. Thank you. And the, the little blue stem, is, is that? That's a grass, it's a native grass. Oh, I know the grass, but I'm wondering what, is it like for farming? Yeah, is that, it's good for uh, various uh, Lepidoptera, the uh, butterflies and moths and various other insects lay their eggs on leaves and so they can make a little bit of a living there uh, so they can you can see them flying around a lot of times little skippers will, will be important then the native grasses in general are very important for butterflies so it's good to add them in and there's there's about six or seven species that uh, that that'll work for that so working them into designs would be a pretty good idea. But I'm on a learning curve with them. That's great. Too. Yes, yeah. right. There's little blue stem and big blue stem and Indian grass are the three major ones. Mm -hmm. A little blue stem gets about this high, big blue stem about this high, and the Indian grass about this high and this wide. Yeah, and mixed in with other plants. Yes. So most of these are meadow plants, right? They've grown in prairies and meadows where they are the structure and all the other flowers grow along and uh -huh. get supported by them are all in there out by itself big blue stem is kind of <laughs> cool but it's it's like a big mm -hmm. and it can get kind of floppy but uh, but they, when they're all knit in together to support each other in the meadow it's pretty pretty beautiful right. one of the good things about the big big the grasses is that, that when they fall over in the from the weight of the snow there's a little cavity that gets created at the base where bumblebees yeah. like to nest oh, and, and bumblebees like to nest within 60 feet of a woodland edge in a meadow like environment that's the preferred mm -hmm. spot so that, uh, the idea of sort of encouraging meadows rather than one kind of species fields for yeah you know for pasturage or whatever yeah the meadows are just a great thing to encourage yeah yes you can always say the sheep's in the meadow the cows in the <laughs> yes right. but true <clears throat> true uh, it's, it's different different management right, regime exactly right but they're also pretty good for pasturage right I mean, there yeah there are some that are but it's hard to have the pasturage and the pollinated. Yeah. But but maybe yeah, you. maybe you could pasture them early spring and they won't do too much damage and then but, but it's tricky. It's tricky when you're trying to uh, help uh, bumblebees do their pollination. It's tricky that way. Or they're not getting their nesting needs met. So when we're we're trying to design or um, provide for uh, for pollinators, we're trying to think about how we can support the highest number of species and also the highest number of individuals within each species. <clears throat> so, trying to create a lot of diversity and abundance, and both of those working together create resilience. Big part uh, of the puzzle here is uh, <clears throat> knowing that bee species fluctuate every year. They're not all at the same rate uh, successful from whether either the flowers that they were taking or the nesting that they uh, chose. <clears throat> so uh, they can make bad choices in nesting. Uh, it could get it rained out or it could be too hot uh, or it could be too cold. So they're fluctuating all the time, and they could have different 
diseases or the flowers that they relied on could be toxic or uh, have pesticides in them. So they're all fluctuating. So when we're trying to, to design for them, we're trying to have the highest diversity of species. Yes, we can create, we can plant one plant that we know bumblebees will go to. That would be nice for that plant and the bumblebee, especially if it was enough of it when they flew to that plant that they had enough to eat and take back to their nest. <clears throat> but when we create diverse plantings, that we're doing a lot more for all the species that are in our neighborhood. Uh, bumblebees are going to fly about a mile, maybe further. And uh, a lot of the other smaller bees, 200 feet to 500 feet or so. So just be aware that if you're seeing a little bee, you know they're not resting too far away. So uh, there are a few good sources um, of plants arranged in something like this is called a bee, ca uh, a bloom calendar. And the bloom calendars are fantastic because it shows you, you know, uh, early, mid, and late season. And the recommendation is always like, well, start with three in each season if you can. So this happens to have at least four, maybe six, and five of these early species, the uh, Aquilegia, the e uh, Eastern Columbine, the Blue Indigo, the Penstemon Digitalis, we showed out, uh, which is the Beard Tongue, is out on the porch. Uh, Ohio Spiderwort, you may have known. Now, any of these plants, uh, you might not know, but you might not know them. So ask me a little bit about them if you say, hey, what is that? But, <clears throat> but for the most part, there are many more. The spring ephemerals are, as I showed you before, the willows are not on this list. But this is from a seed mix from the National Resource Conservation Service. So this is what's available in the seed world at the time that this bloom calendar was made. But it's a decent start. Question about a seed mix. I presume that's all seeds mixed together and you would plant those just depending on where. You would, would you prepare a bed or would you just scatter those? Scatter, you mean just out on the lawn? Yeah. Uh, not really. Uh, there wouldn't be much success in scattering them where other plants are. But they're sort of chosen so that they would work well if you just... Prepared ground. So the idea when you're doing a seed, when you're seeding, is that you really need to eliminate <clears throat> a very high percentage of the seed bank that's in the soil already. Uh, so there are a couple... Eliminate what? Seed bank. The seed, uh, the, all the seeds that are in that, that piece of ground that you're working on. It's hard because seeds are competing. So there's a couple different ways. You can solarize by putting plastic over top of a big thing and trying to cook it. You can do that if you start early in Vermont in the south or west, southwestern slope where it gets a lot of heat or a lot of open sunlight beating down, but it'll probably take two years. Or you can till. You can till in the, in the spring when it's dry enough to till, and then everything will emerge. You know, thousands of different seedlings will emerge. And then you do it again in June or so, or early July, and then everything will come out, and then you do it again. Can I make a pitch against that? Yeah. Um, when you're tilling, you're destroying the microbiology in the soil. This is something I've been learning yeah. about soils. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my favorite ways of terminating whatever's on the ground is putting in a weed barrier that will decompose and just building on top of that and yes. some compost and mulch. And yes, so that was another yeah, technique. Was, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the solarization. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not promoting oh, it. I'm just talking a, about the tilling. I oh, I'm sorry. I, I, meant, I meant the yeah. tilling. Yeah. Yes, so when you're tilling, you're disturbing a lot. Yeah. But you are eliminating a lot of the, what's in the seed bank by doing that. The other way is to till and plant buckwheat. And buckwheat grows very fast. 
Uh, so everything will start sprouting along with the buckwheat, and then the buckwheat will come up and create, especially if you get a good, good cover, it'll shut out all the light to the plants that emerged, feed a lot of pollinators, and then you can do that twice in a year. But that's still tilling. Um, but I wouldn't till in very sandy, hot, dry soil as, easy, as readily as I would in a place where there's a lot of moisture, or enough moisture to do it. And the other, the other way is to cover with cardboard, perhaps, but it's a fairly limited amount of space you can actually do that in. But if you have a garden, that's not a bad way to go. Because you can cover with cardboard, <coughs> cut everything down really low, <coughs> mow it, perhaps, <coughs> cover with cardboard, and put some, you know, bark mulch or compost or something on top and plant, push it aside, push the compost aside, plant, put your plant in there and cover it back up. That's a way to go. Another way to go is to prepare the ground through, um, through eliminating um, all the seeds before and then plant very thickly. All the seedlings, and that takes tilling as well. So there's no real easy way around get, uh, competing all the competition, with all the competition. If you're planting a quarter acre or more, it's recommended that you go to seeding because the cost of buying plugs starts, starts to be very expensive after you get past a quarter acre. A quarter acre is still a fair, fairly large um, piece of ground to, to buy plugs in. So it makes, it makes it worth buying small plants and plugs rather than buying big plants. Um, but none of it's really cheap when you're trying to eliminate everything that's there especially the larger the property you have. It's a much bigger deal. So you would want to do, if you're going to do any tilling, better to do it on flattish land, plant, land that doesn't have much of a slope to it, so you don't lose a lot of your topsoil when you're preparing the ground. Yeah? How deep do you need to till to get rid of that growing, um, your grow, growing layer is filled with wheat seeds? seeds and and material right uh root root zone material two to four inches is generally recommended some sometimes six depending on the soil but you don't want to go too deep because the deeper you go the more more seeds you're going to stir up the other way you could go instead of plowing i, I wouldn't plow with disc your disking can just go through all that plant root material and, and cut it up a lot without churning it and if you do that a number of times that's probably the, the safest way to go really rather than a rotor tiller that's going to be just fluffing everything up but when you're doing it with a tractor you're also dealing with compaction with heavy wheels so there's lots of trade-offs the larger your property the, the more you have to get bigger machines involved in it the larger the, the, the area that you want to affect change. So, so we, uh, this, is, this is a nice list here. Uh, anybody know partridge pea? I'm just picking out ones that you might not know of. Uh, Virginia Mountain Mint. Um, Here's the gray goldenrod I mentioned earlier that is more uh, of a clump former. So anyway, this is a nice start of this for, for seed in general. Can, can these seeds like be started indoors under lights and such, or is it best to? This, this is for seeding, uh, so yes you can, mix, so but this is probably going to be straight mix. It's oh, not okay. going to be something you're going to be gardening with per se. Mm -hmm. Remember I was talking out uh, back with the plants that if you're gardening, you're wanting more of a consistent look in a way. Right. If you're trying to get something out of a plant, you better better to grow a bunch of them to see which ones. If you're trying to garden with a wild seed mix, better to live with them for a while and see how they really grow. Because a, a wild seed mix is going, those plants are going to act differently depending on the genetics in that system where they those plants came from. A lot of times they're mixing the seeds anyway from different places. Mm -hmm. So this is a, 
like this handout. So I compiled this and added a lot to it and made it look prettier and everything. But um, <clears throat> this came from Suzanne Hale. From uh, She's doing a big project at the New England Small Farm Institute in Belchertown, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, does anybody know her? Suzanne? OK. Um, anyway, I chopped it down to plants that could actually uh, survive in hot sunny soils and uh, it was hard getting it all into one page. But what I want to talk to you about later, later today is uh, these, <clears throat> when you're designing, designing in structural layers, um, in these, <clears throat> the different design layers are the structural, the seasonal theme, and the functional, which, which makes it easier to try to understand. So the structure, structural plants, are the plants are the rather tall, four feet or higher. And the seasonal theme are smaller. And they're going to be things you would do something like <clears throat> do something a little bit more that has more movement in the landscape. More like rivers and streams and scatters. Then the functional is the ground cover that actually holds the soil together and keeps it all unified and modifies the soil and keeps, um, keeps other plants from growing uh, and competing with the whole system. Any questions on that? Is that on your website? No, should be. It's not yet. Thank you. Thanks for that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. what are your colors? I'm sorry. Colors. What are the colors? What do they indicate? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So uh, they're the color of the bloom. And uh, when it comes to grasses, it's the color of the grass and the bloom. It's very uh, iffy because they change a lot. Uh, but the colors are, have more are associated with uh, the bloom color for all the other plants. And this is my eye trying to pick out the color on a wheel from memory of what that plant, <laughs> it's very, it's very, uh, don't take it as, as the, uh, God's truth or anything. But important to look at, uh, blue is a very important plant for, for mm -hmm. pollinators. They, they're very attracted to it. So whenever you get a blue plant, go for it. <laughs> so I try to, the, uh, try to make sure I got as many of those in here as possible. Baptisia. Australis is great blue, early bloomer, it attracts uh, bumblebees and is a nitrogen fixer. It takes nitrogen out of the air and puts it into the soil What's and so she ba Baptisia, Australis, and there's the other one, another one too, other, there are other uh, Baptisias. But I chose this one because, because of the blue. But there are others. Um, and then there's a uh, hoary vervain that has like a bluish flower, which I like a lot. And uh, this uh, drummond aster, which I never saw before, but I think I can't wait to see it. And then the uh, aster oblongifolia, which are the ones that bloom late into the season that I mentioned. Uh, and those aster slides. And then a campanula. So, I think it's really important to kind of focus on, on the blue plant, plants and to see and, and create gardens that are, have uh, them in it. And I really like the boss, uh, wild blue uh, indigo, the Baptisia, because it's a structural plant as well. So it's kind of fairly big plant. It takes up a lot of space and you can really set a rhythm to many of your designs with them. Yeah, how much they how much they need? Most of them are in the low, and then most of them are low to moderate, and then there are others that are really really low. What about the sun? These are all sun sun loving plants. Sun loving. Okay. sun loving plants that can take sun, yeah. full sun. Sun loving plants that take dry soils. 
So important consideration in any meadow or prairie is uh, the root depth, okay. right? So you see this, you often see this associated with the prairie work that was done out in uh, the Midwest, Wisconsin. So look at the depth of those roots. Uh, a lot of times grasses have the deepest roots. Look at turf grass. What's that? Turf grass. Turf grass. If you're mowing it all the time, it can't get much energy, right? You're, you're, but it looks nice. And the other, uh, the other part is the, the structure above, which is pretty important. So, um, structure, structure matters when all these start flowering, but, um, and a lot of them, some of them would be large, some would be medium, some would be low. And different species, lots of different species can have activity when there's lots of uh, niches that, that are all over the place, right? So it can't be dominated one, one big species, say uh, a field of clover. A lot of times it gets dominated by bumblebees, honeybees, and not much else. Uh, that is white clover, and then red clover is almost the same but it has more variation in its size. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But we generally garden this way anyway. We generally garden with plants up and down. But just know that you're actually creating, by gardening, gardeners are really important, you're creating more species uh, diversity potential <clears throat> by doing it. I'm wondering about the, um, the tall uh, white clover and yellow clover. Those are good. Um, they're good in the field. They're pretty, uh, the white clover is pretty aggressive <coughs> in a garden situation. But they feed nitrogen and they feed bees. Depends on your, what you're trying to do. But, the, but on the ground plane, white clover can be pretty aggressive and pretty thick. So there's not too much that can really compete. But then you would want to grow medium sized plants and taller plants to coexist with the clover. But the clover would have a hard time when the shade comes. They won't grow so robustly. So you could always playing with that sun. And when you're planting something, if something wants a little shade, you can plant it behind a bigger plant, as long as it can compete with the mm -hmm. roots. So we want to maximize floral density, too. So, uh, so here, when we look at this picture here, it's fairly dense, right? We look at this. Lots of flowers, closer together. So planting relatively close creates more of a meadow effect, creates more of the effect that lots of different species can get lots, there's a lot more food available when you have a lot of species mixing. They get enough sun, they can compete in the soil. <clears throat> so plants are always, there's a there's partitioning of sunlight so some plants are going to be very robust and take it all in up here. And others can exist off a little less in the shade of that plant, get around here. And then the ones on the ground are pretty much going to do their flowering early and then do their spreading after that. That's how the ground covers can exist in a planting. Uh, not necessarily, but plants that can, if you plant, picking the plant for the site, you don't have, you shouldn't have to do much fertilizing at all. Maybe if, maybe if you're feeling like that they're really struggling, there's no nutrition here for any of these, you might want to boost it up. But for most native plants in general, especially these plants for the, for the site we're choosing with lots of sun, dry soils, they shouldn't need much. Surprising that lupin wouldn't be able to grow there and butterfly weed. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh-huh. It's really strange. Huh. Well, and bearberry, which I'll show you later. Yes, I tried that as well. But, uh -huh. um, Grasses might be the next thing. You might, uh, you might want to have some little blue stems that will go really deep yeah. for the first couple of years and let them build up, 
con connection to the deeper parts of the soil before you put smaller plants in that need to, you know, would, would benefit from those channels created by the grasses. Because the grass, seed, the grass um, roots would start dying in those places where the roots were would have tunnels that would help other plants around them get access to deeper parts of the, I mean, it could have been also that, you know, you needed to water more often maybe to get them established, but it sounds like you were taking care of them though. Right. Okay. I don't have my mother's food. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want that other slide? Yeah, that one. Yeah, species richness of plant families. Okay, so we're talking about a minimum nine species, 16 species gets to be more really good if you can, you know, like four or five in each species in each season or so. <clears throat> but there is a direct correlation uh, between the number of species and the num number of species of pollinators and bees related to the number of plant species. So especially if you vary the family. Like if it's all clover, then it's going to be lot, lot, all the clover family. It's going to be a little different if you mix all the different families up because you have more species that way. So, you, and also you diversify the flower color and the shape. You start adding more potential. This is all, this is all about having more diversity, right? and more numbers, so you start adding the numbers of flowers and the number of different kinds of flowers, that's how you get it.